Okay. Well, like I said, it's uh, good to be back to have class. Uh, we're continuing our study in discipleship tonight, and in this study, we're going to be having uh, more conversation about what it means to be a disciple of Jesus. And I, I, I'm loving this study, and a lot of it's because we're not just getting to look at the Gospels, but we're getting to match how the Gospels and other letters in the New Testament uh, kind of say the same thing and how they paint this big picture of as disciples, as Christians, what it is we do, what we look like. And tonight we start the process of sharing the call to discipleship. We've looked at various characteristics of a disciple. And while we will still be discussing some of these, we want to focus on that call and what that call means for the individual Christian. And so I want to start out with this question. And remember, you can unmute yourself and uh, share for this, but when you think of being called to discipleship, what comes to your mind when you think of being called to discipleship? Crickets. Nobody want to say nothing? Well, you do, Valentine. Come on, man. What do you think of when you think of being called to discipleship? The first thing that comes to my mind is sharing the gospel with another. Okay, the, so the call to share the gospel with other people. Absolutely. Right. What else comes to mind? We're going to have a quiet time tonight. Uh, following Christ's example of how to live your life. That's uh, another way we share what we believe. Yeah, following Christ's example of how to live a life. Uh, it's another way we share, and it's also what we've been called to do. And your dog agreed as well with that statement. <laughs> Any other thoughts? The thought that came to to my my mind is everyone we're all called to be uh to to disciple others okay so we're all called so as a disciple we're all called to disciple others and um that's actually absolutely true and that's vital to a uh, christian's understanding I, I know when i think about the call to discipleship i think about the call of sacrifice right it, it's uh, you have to sacrifice something to follow the teacher and to emulate him and to be like him. Um, another question I wanted to ask at the beginning was, um, what do you personally find um, the most challenging about being a disciple of Jesus? What are those things that you find most challenging? Or maybe the things you find least challenging? Nothing's challenging. <laughs> Josh, I think the most challenging for me is being, is opening up and um, spreading the word of, you know, the gospel, uh, you know, because I'm afraid of rejection and I'm afraid okay. of losing uh, friendships uh, and stuff. So that's, that's what, you know, I think. So the, the challenging aspect of opening up and sharing the gospel with others because we might lose those friendships that we have. And, and that's a very real fear, and that's a real challenge that we face as disciples. Uh, although this quarter we've been talking more so about us as disciples rather than how to make disciples, I mean, that comes into the equation quite a bit as we go into discipleship and following Christ. What other challenges do you guys have? I know for me, I'll, while you guys are thinking, I know for me, one of the challenges I've, I struggle with and especially struggled with as a, a teenager and college student is the kind of being on game all the time when uh, other people are watching or even when they're not watching. I mean, it's a challenge to always be asking, how would God want me to handle a situation? 
uh, or how would God want me to react to a circumstance? Uh, because we're called to have the attitude and mind of Christ. And I know for me, it's really easy to think about, but it's more difficult to do in person. I think Ben has something. He looks like he's standing up and moving closer. Yeah, uh, kind of going off of that is I, I tend to be a perfectionist. And so it's hard for me not to get really frustrated with myself if I continually make the same mistake over and over because I'll keep telling myself I should have done it this way. And then two minutes later, I respond the wrong way again. And so to me, it's just not getting frustrated with myself. Okay, so uh, not getting frustrated whenever we struggle to actually maintain uh, what we are called and desiring to maintain. And, you know, as they say, the struggle is real, right? I think we all can relate to that. Um, Gosh. Yes. I don't know who's talking, I, but yes. I think every day can be a challenge. I mean, as, as you start a new day, you go to work, it can be a challenge just driving around the freeways. Then you yes. have to put out with your employee, with the coworkers. So a lot of times for me is challenges every day try to keep myself as a christian because you'd be surprised how much stuff goes on in construction site everything from foul language to a lies to a bully and everything else so i think every day can be a challenge to be a christian or be a follower of christ absolutely it's definitely a challenge and um and we all work in different er areas and arenas um, uh, or whether you go to school or whatever it might be. And we face challenges. And I, I, one thing I love about when we get together, especially in person, is it's, it's encouraging because uh, whether we fess up to it or not, we all face challenges throughout that week. And it's encouraging to be around other imperfect people as we're made perfect by Jesus Christ. And uh, it's a blessing and encouragement to me. As we go into the lesson tonight, we're, we're going to look at four different aspects of our call, and then we're going to do a few more aspects next week on this. And one of those aspects is what we just said and was already said by a couple of people, and, and that's the idea that we're all called, uh, and this is kind of the no-brainer one, we're, we're all called to be a disciple. And I, I forgot who said this, it may have been Robert, but we all are called to participate not only in making disciples, but in being disciples. If you're a Christian, you're a follower of Christ. You're one who is to seek a life like that of Christ and to try to get as close as absolutely possible to sharing that life with Jesus and to being holy in the way that he calls us to be holy the the famous text on the call to discipleship is in Matthew chapter 28. And again, as normal, I don't have the scriptures up, so hopefully you have the Bible. But in Matthew chapter 28 and 18, 19, and 20, we see this universal call to discipleship. And it, it says in verse 18, Jesus came and he said to them, all authority in heaven on, on earth has been given to me to go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations. And then it explains, how do you make disciples? Will you baptize them? And then it says, not only do you baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, but then you teach them to observe not just some, but all that I have commanded you. And I always argue that if it's all that he's commanded them, it includes this right here, which goes along with what I think it was Robert said, that we're all called to make disciples. And then it says, not only teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, but it's kind of this uh, reminder that he's always with us to the end of the age, uh, not as he's going to get us, but that he's there. And as we're fulfilling his mission, he's present with us. And so this call was given initially to the disciples at the resurrection and right before the ascension of Jesus Christ. But it means that we are called as Christians, not just to make disciples, but to be a disciple. Uh, I, it's the idea of a fruit tree. I, I know a lot of Bible studies and for non-Christians use this concept of, um, you know, what does an apple tree make? Well, apple trees make apple trees, right? Um, it, an apple tree doesn't make a green bean plant, for example. And so as Christians, we're called 
uh, when we become a Christian, we're called to become a disciple just as the person who discipled us was a disciple, just as Paul was a disciple, just as Christ himself was a disciple of God. So we're all called to be disciples. Um, did I see someone pop up that was going to comment? Okay. Um, so while we've discussed this at great length, it's important to be reminded that we've all been called to not only make the disciples, but first we have to be disciples. And going back to the apple tree makes an apple, if we ourselves are not disciples, if we ourselves are not striving to be like Christ, it's going to be very difficult for us to make disciples of Jesus Christ especially if we're just living and doing whatever it is we want and thinking, well, God will understand. And then we turn around and wonder why the people we're trying to disciple aren't following Christ. Well, if we're not following Christ to the best of our ability, they're going to struggle to follow Christ to the best of their ability. And so it's a reminder that we need to have. Uh, I would suggest that it's fruitless to go about making disciples if we ourselves are not being disciples. Now, that doesn't mean we don't mess up. But what it means is we're striving to be like Jesus Christ. Because um, if we're not striving to be like Christ, yet we're still trying to make disciples, we're essentially saying, do as I say, not as I do. And that's a recipe for disaster. Uh, and that's essentially what the Pharisees were doing, wasn't it? They were saying, hey, here's the teaching of the law. But even Jesus pointed out, they themselves could not maintain the extra stuff they were uh, burdening the people of God with. And so we talk about the initial call to be a disciple and we don't really want to take a lot of time to discuss this because I've got other questions I really want to get to, but something to keep in the back of your mind is maybe who is a follower of Christ or who is a disciple of Christ that really had a big impact on you and your spiritual walk and maybe asking why and what was so impactful from them. I, I've got people all throughout my life that I, I look at and I'm like, man, I really want to be a disciple like they were because they had such a big impact in the positive. Some can have a negative impact, but in the positive, they had such a big impact on me. And I can remember vividly why and what it was that had an impact on me. Some of them, it was how giving they were to others. Um, some of them that I look up to, it was not so much how they were so giving of their, themselves and their time and their money to others, but maybe the relationship and walk they had with God and the the one-on-one -on -one relationship they seemed to have and carry with God that I just looked up to. But we all have had someone that's made a great impact on us. And so thinking back to that, it helps us kind of ask, what do we want to be remembered for by the disciples we make and the disciples we lead and that helps us orient ourselves into, okay, I've been called to be this disciple. Am I living according to it? But just as most of us have had some, um, someone make an impact on us, we want to impact other people, as I've kind of already mentioned here. And uh, to do that, it, require, it requires that we become devoted to being disciples and to being sacrificial in our walk with Jesus Christ. And so we've been called to sacrifice as well. We've been called to sacrificially live, to sacrificially follow Jesus in his footsteps. I mean, Jesus paid the ultimate sacrifice. He ultimately gave up his life, and he told us that we are called to do the same, not just to give up a life for him, but to give up a life for each other. And so we're called to this sacrifice. So as disciples of Christ, how, do we, how are we called to sacrifice as we live our lives? What does it look like to sacrifice as we live our lives as disciples? This is great in theory, but what are some of the actual practical things it calls us to Putting God first. Okay, so putting God first. So what does that look like to you, Brittany? Um, doing things for others. Um, um, I mean, we, we went over so many. Doing things for, for others. Um, regularly fellowshipping. 
take yourself out of the equation. You got to put him before yourself. Oh, that's good. So taking yourself out of the equation, putting him before you, doing things for others sacrificially, which also means doing it when it's not convenient, right? What else are things that d uh, demonstrate that sacrificial living? Do, 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 do. Anything else? I think I've got uh, ideas. <laughs> I think on top of you know putting God first, it's also um, you know letting that flow through your life. You know who who do you spend time with? Who um, you know where do you, how do you use your money? How do you mm. act? How do you do these different things? You know um, what do you post on Facebook? I think it kind of flows through that and giving up um, the parts of yourself that you want to keep away from God but saying that God is God over every part of, of who you are. Oh, that's good answers. Luke chapter nine. I've got a couple of, ver oh, go ahead, whoever unmuted. Sorry, I got to come to the light. You're so, fine. Come into the light. <laughs> we're saying not live the American dream. So you oh, don't have point. the newest thing. You don't have all the new outfits. I mean, there's nothing wrong with having two pairs of jeans. You don't need 10 pairs of jeans. You know, you don't need the new purse. You don't need the new whatever it is, just because that's what America expects you to have or the world expects you to have. It's not what you need, it's what you want. Okay, and so not chasing those, uh, that American dream, uh, the wants and wants, and it makes me think of the people who basically just have their barns filled with all these toys and 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 you know it's not even the owning them that's the wrong it's the owning them and doing nothing with them and kind of hoarding stuff right the man who filled his barns with grain and he said i have plenty and so now i'm not going to do anything and doesn't share any was condemned by god but as tamar was saying we don't chase things uh my favorite uh, well not my favorite but uh, there's a country song that talks about he's never seen a uh a hearst with a trailer hitch uh, I'm convinced he's never been in Arkansas. However, um, he, he, the whole point he's making is you can't take it with you. And we need to stop chasing the things that don't matter. Right. And th like Tamara said, there's nothing wrong with having jeans. In fact, I'm a big fan of having clothing um, for all of us, but it's where are we putting our priority and our emphasis in gathering things? I, by the way, I think this is one of the neat things about the coronavirus is I've heard a lot of people recently talking about how it helps them realize things and stuff isn't nearly as important because they're surrounded with things and stuff. What they're not surrounded with is relationships. And so they're having this reevaluation of priorities in life. And I think that's one of the neat ways that God's moving today. But I can't go too deep into that because that gets into my sermon for Sunday that I'm going to preach. So, uh, so come back Sunday. <laughs> Um, Luke nine verses 23 and 27. He said to all, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily and follow me for whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. For what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses or forfeits himself for whoever is ashamed of me and of my words of him will the son of man be ashamed when he comes in his glory and the glory of the father and of the holy angels. But I tell you truly, there are some standing here who, who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God. And I like so many things about this passage. Not only does it talk about denying ourselves and taking up our cross daily to follow God and that kind of sacrifice, but it talks about a sacrifice that I think hits on what Tamar had mentioned, and that is it's no benefit to gain everything in this physical realm. And it doesn't have to be material even. If you are the most popular person on the planet, that is of no benefit if you lose your soul, if your priority is wrong, and if you're not chasing what's true. And so we're called to sacrifice what we want for the greater good of God's kingdom and what God wants. And that doesn't mean we don't get what we want sometimes, but 
whenever one has to give, it should be uh, God that wins. And we should give of our want so that we can attend to God's uh, desire for us. And so when we talk about taking up the cross daily, as we saw the other week, the concept is also present in the writings of Paul. And I, as I said, I love the overlap of the Gospels and many of the New Testament letters when it comes to discipleship. Paul, as he's writing to the church in Philippi, in Philippians chapter 2, verses 3 and 4, he says this, and I believe this is a really good indicator of what it looks like as well to be called to sacrifice. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit. But in humility, count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. This doesn't mean that we are called to just be down on ourselves and think very lowly of ourselves and you know, say, oh, everyone's so great and I'm such a horrible person. That's not what this is talking about. What it's talking about is that very first sentence. Don't be selfish or conceited. Think of yourself as who you are, no more nor less. See yourself through the eyes of God and see others through the eyes of God. And then in verse four, it reiterates that in looking to not only your interests, but the interests of others, right? The greater good. Whenever they start talking about, we need to social distance, we don't do it be only because the, we were told there was a mandate to do that. We do that because we're looking at the best interest of others as well right? As Christians, we ought to be leading the charge in saying we want to keep people healthy. And if this is the best option we have, then we're going to do it as uncomfortable and unpleasant as it is. And as Christians, whenever we're looking to the interest of others, we are demonstrating to the world that God cares about other people. And we're inviting them into that relationship with God, especially when we connect that verbally uh, again, which we'll get into on Sunday morning. But this is important, not just for dealing with the world, but for dealing with other disciples, right? As disciples, we, we come from a variety of backgrounds, and we all have to play nice together, basically. We all have to let go of our own wants and desires for that of the greater good, because what I want sometimes isn't what's best for all of you, and what you want sometimes isn't what's best for the rest of us. And uh, I, I saw this a lot in youth ministry for my really long, like year and a half, 10 year in youth ministry. But I did do a little bit of youth ministry in college as well. But I, I saw this come into play off and on. And I'm sure we all as parents struggle with this. But where I would have parents who wanted a very specific thing done or I need you to move the entire plan to another day at another time because out of the, I, I had like 60 something kids, out of the 60 something kids, my one child cannot attend. So you need to change all of your plans because 59 of them can and my one can't, right? Now I know that's an extreme example, but as disciples, how many times are we that person that is trying whether it's in life or whether we're begging God or we're in, or it's in an interchange with others, we're struggling with that mentality of, I know this isn't what's working for everybody else, but this is what I personally want to do. Right. And that it gets hard. It gets hard to sacrifice that. Sometimes I don't want to sacrifice that, but uh, it, it, it's very, very hard. I had a, my wife surprised me and I know this will be hard to believe that this got me excited. My wife surprised me with apparently they have Jolly Rancher flavored jelly beans. Amazing, by the way, the light blue ones are absolutely the best. Um, so I've had them on my home office desk over here for a few days now, and uh, I just kind of eat and pick at them. And um, you know, my my oldest daughter comes in and she sees them every time, and she it starts at eight thirty in the morning and it continues all day long. Of Daddy, can I have a jelly bean? daddy, can I have a jelly bean? And the truth is, I don't want to share my jelly beans. Now, granted, I eventually told her to take them and put them in the uh, pantry so that I don't eat all the jelly beans. However, as Christians, we're dealing with something much more serious than jelly beans. We're dealing with souls. We're dealing with the kingdom of God and the work of God in the community. And so we have to be able to sacrifice sometimes what we personally want for what God wants 
or what's best for the community of believers. Um, we're called to be sacrificial and to live a life of sacrificial uh, nature, looking to the interest of others. But not only is our call to make and be, to be disciples and to make disciples who live sacrificially, but we've also been called to go beyond that and to surrender ourselves. And surrender is important because this goes along with the idea of sacrifice. Surrender is something that's vital because it, it helps us identify and it shares with God that we know that we are not the ultimate authority in things, that God himself is the ultimate authority. In Galatians chapter 2, verses 17 through 21, reads, but if in our endeavor to be justified in Christ, we too were found to be sinners, is Christ then a servant of sin? Certainly not. For if I rebuilt what I tore down, I proved myself to be a transgressor. For I through the law, for I through the law, sorry, for if I, man, I cannot read. Okay. So for through the law, I died to the law so that I might live to God. Look at verse 20. I have this underlined. I have been crucified with Christ, right? I, every time I read this, I think of that song I grew up singing. I've been crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Yeah. Anyway, it says, I have been crucified with Christ. I have surrendered myself is this idea here. Church, if we are disciples, that means we are people who not only live sacrificially, we are people not only called to a purpose of being a disciple and making disciples, but we are called to surrender ourselves to God. And that happens at our crucifixion. And so it said, he says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, which is amazing because it goes right with what we just talked about. If it's not I who live, but Christ who lives in me, that means I have not only sacrificed my own personal wants and desires, but I have surrendered those and given them into the hands of God. I've given myself, my actions, my attitude, everything I do into the hands of God. And then he says in verse 21, I do not nullify the grace of God, for if righteousness were through the law, then Christ died for no purpose. And so there's so much depth in this passage. We're not going to talk about all of it, but Part of being crucified is that idea of surrender that we have done. As we're baptized, we surrender ourselves and we're submitting ourselves to him in obedience. Uh, I, I say this a lot. If God said, go and rub dirt or mud all over your body, roll around in the mud or whatever it might be, that's what we would be doing. But that's not what he said. He said, go and be baptized. Not because the water is special, but because we are showing surrender to him by doing it the way he asked it to be done rather than the way I want it to be done, right? And so, and by the way, the act in and of itself is a surrender act when, when we're baptized. And so this isn't the only passage that talks about the need to surrender. James 4 verse 7 talks about submission and or surrender when it says, submit yourselves therefore to God, resist the devil and he will flee from you. So we surrender ourselves to God which means we surrender ourselves to the authorities God puts into place, whether that be the shepherds, whether that be the uh, rulers of the country, even whenever it's laws we don't like, as long as they don't go against the teachings of God, we surrender to those, right? When we're driving and we see a speed limit we don't like, we generally need to surrender to that speed limit unless we have an emergency because that's what has been put in place by the authorities and Scripture says the authorities are given authority by God because God's in control, right? But we surrender in the same way our wants, our desires, ourselves, our life, everything to God. When we give in contribution, I'm doing this, most people give online or through ACH these days, but when we give contribution to God, all we're really doing is surrendering to God part of what he's given to us. And we're showing through that surrender our reliance on him. And so what are some of the things that we can surrender to God? I've mentioned a bunch of stuff, but what are some other things? I'm going to get a drink of water while you think. 
Um, I think we can surrender like our worries. Like we worry about stuff and we say we're giving it to God and we do for a hot minute. Then we're like, oh, let me take this back and worry about it some more, you know, because God can't, you know, take care of it on himself, himself. So we, we give it, but we don't completely give it. We take it back. Yeah, it, we, we do that all the time. We, we give something to God and then we, we let God handle it for a little bit. And then we say, oh, you're not moving fast enough or you're not doing it the right way I want it done. So we kind of yank it back out of his hands. And worry is one of those things. Anything else that we are called to surrender? I think a lot of times we, uh, as Americans, it's very common for people to just throw money at things. You know, here, let me give you money, you take care of it. But I think it's very important for us to give our time and actually get into the service ourselves, not expect yeah. somebody else to do it because we are supporting them. You know, you touched on something that I, I wish I had thought to put in my notes here, and that is the uh, surrendering of our time, because that is something we need to surrender to God. Uh, I, I put on here worry, anxiety which goes hand in hand with worry and um, ambition, which we talked about desires and wants we talked about. So there's a lot of stuff that we surrender to God, but we're not only called to surrender. We're also called to holiness. We, we're called to be a disciple. We're called to sacrifice. We're called to surrender and we're called to be holy. And this is one of the ones I, I truly love to talk about because it's a concept that was very common in ancient Israel. It's found all throughout the Old Testament. It's even found in the New Testament, but it's not talked about a whole lot uh, in Christianity. What we do is we talk about a lot of what we shouldn't do, and a lot of times I hear that as being taught what holiness is, but that's actually not what holiness fully engulfs. And so holiness is something we've been called to. Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2 says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice. And this is what it means to be a living sacrifice, to be holy and acceptable to God. And so when you present yourself as a living sacrifice, that one who is holy and acceptable, this becomes, it says, a spiritual worship. Do not be conformed. And then it tells you what it means to be holy and acceptable. Don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what the will of God is, what is good and acceptable and perfect. And so we've been called as Christians to live a holy life. Paul's not the only one who writes this. Peter wrote this in his first epistle. In chapter 2, verses 9 through 12, he says, But you, you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people who for uh, sorry, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. And then I love his kind of side note. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you have not had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh which wage war against your soul. Verse 12, keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. So a couple of things I want to point out about this. When it comes to our holiness, it has less to do with you and I and more to do with the glory of God. And Honestly, that's about 99.9% .9 of everything we've been asked to do and everything we've been instructed to do in how we live. It's about glorifying God and bringing others to him. This says in verse 9, you've, we've been chosen as a race. We've been become royal priesthood. We've been called to be a holy nation collectively, if you will. We've been given as God's own possession, but we've been given these things not just for our benefit, the benefits we get out of this, the salvation, all that stuff, that, that's kind of a side benefit. The primary purpose for all of this, and this isn't just Peter. Paul talks about this. Jesus talks about this. The Old Testament prophets talk about this. Uh, God himself in the Old Testament talks about this when talking to Israel. Um, the whole purpose of this is, look in verse 9, that you might proclaim the excellencies of him who called you from darkness 
And then look in verse 12, keep your conduct honorable among the Gentiles. Why? It's not so they praise us, but it's so that they might glorify God. Now, keep in mind here, we are called to do two things in this passage, or through our actions and through our words, we do two things. We proclaim Christ, and we are called to demonstrate holiness so that it proclaims Christ through actions and word here. And so we are called to be holy disciples because it is a direct reflection on God. By living a holy life, we are able to demonstrate the holiness of God to all of those around us, leading them to glorify God either directly or indirectly. Again, this doesn't mean we remain silent. Um, there was a big movement several years ago where people would um, just kind of chant this mantra of live a holy life because that may be the only um, message that someone ever sees about God or something along those lines. And while that's theoretically kind of a nice concept, the problem with that is we're not called only to um, live a good life. We're called to proclaim Christ, not just in action, but in words. And we, we've had a big era of time now in which Christians have proclaimed Christ in action, but they've not matched it with words. And then we're as a church, and I'm talking collectively in the United States, as a church, we stand around holding our hands up going, okay, where's all the disciples? We've been living good lives. But the problem is we've left it up to the preachers and the youth ministers and the shepherds to proclaim Christ rather than taking that responsibility that we have as disciples. And so we live a holy life because then our words and our deeds match that of God, and it brings people into a relationship with him. So as, a, as Christians, we have received the call to discipleship, to be surrendering to Christ, to sacrifice, and to holiness. We've been called to live according to these principles so that others can see Christ in us, and our words and our actions will combine and bring them into relationship with him. This week, I want to encourage us uh, to pray for not only each other as we walk through this life and as we proclaim Christ, but to pray that somehow in some way in all of this coronavirus, God is using it so that we have a platform that we can proclaim Christ and we can live as Christ. Um, this is happening. There's research coming out that's been done and it started being done in January when coronavirus came and then it's this, it's been hitting hard since all these different states have been doing stay at home orders there's research showing an uptick like a huge uptick in people's interest in god and spirituality um there is a humongous growth on googling for and yahoo and bing for searches on prayer God, online church, church, stuff like that. They're seeing huge growths in this. And so we are living in a time, which kind of again gets into my sermon that we're going to be preaching on in, on Sunday. We're living in a time in which, yeah, this really is not fun to live in and go through, but we're seeing so many people rekindle an interest in God that we, we ought to be capitalizing on it. I put out there on Sunday, Easter Sunday, we had 377 unique screens, if you will, log in during the live events through YouTube and Facebook combined. Now, both of those have gone up because we leave the recording up so people can see them later. But over 377 unique logins. Out of those, I don't remember the exact percentage, but something like 86 or 80 percent of those logins stayed for the uh, an average of the entire service. So, which means the majority of people stayed the entire time for our service, beginning to end, because it tracks all this stuff in the background. That's 377 screens. There were three people behind the screen my wife was looking at. There's a bunch of people behind the Johnson screen. Guys, we had, if we had put all those people in the same building, we would have had to have two to three worship services to handle that amount of people. That is the highest online presence we've had, even though we've been streaming for a couple of years now. Now, some of those people 
we know, or I know at least that came from, I know someone was watching from Canada that I know, someone from England, someone from Virginia. So there's a few scattered around the US that can't physically get here, but there is an uptick. There's research showing small or large churches, doesn't matter, anyone who's having online services, they're having this huge burst of participation from people. God is working. We are called to be disciples. And as we fine tune our discipleship, I think we're going to see God work and bring in more and new disciples as well. So this week, I, I say all that to say, uh, I, got, I got really carried away and off my talk with her, but I say all that to say this week, I, I want to encourage uh, us to continue to encourage this in each other, this deepening of our discipleship and our walk. And I want to pray for each other but I also want you to keep in mind this uptick in interest and pray for the fields that are ready for a harvest out there because we're trying to be better disciples, but there's a lot of people who I think are going to be very interested very soon in being disciples as well. Let's go to God in prayer and then I'll let us talk for a few minutes. And as I always say here in a few minutes, I'm going to go put my kids to bed, but you guys can stay on as long as you want. Father, thank you so much for this day. We thank you for the opportunity to worship and to talk about you. Help us to be disciples who are continually growing, who are continually learning, who are continually striving to be more like you. And help us to not be beat up by these lessons, but to help identify where we might individually and collectively grow in these things so that we can proclaim you vocally and in the way that we live to those all around us. We know that there's an uptick in interest in you. And we ask that you bless us through that and help us to figure out ways that we can creatively reach out to those individuals and um, to help them learn more about you and to become a Christian. Father, we're just so blessed to have you with us in times like these. Help us to never forget that you're present. Help us to, to stay strong as we continue to push forward, waiting for the day that even just physically on earth, we can reunite in person when all of this is over. Thank you so much for your love. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. I'm going to unmute everyone in case y'all want to talk.